national the expansion of our development programs and unprecedented achievements in the provision of electricity, construction of roads, and access to clean water single out my administration as evidently development oriented. Thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the offices of rulers and parliament for the welfare of society and just government men. We beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in this land. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in this house assembled. Grant us that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberations in so just and faithful a manner to promote thy honor and glory, to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of this country and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our care. Amen. Communication from the chair. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia, Mr. Adam Abaro. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic, my Lord, the Chief Justice of the Gambia and Justices of the Superior Courts. Former Vice Presidents here in present, former Deputy Speakers of the National Assembly, Honorable Deputy Speaker and Honorable Members of the National Assembly, Honorable Cabinet Ministers here in present, former Members of the National Assembly, Members of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps, Secretary General and Head of the Civil Service, Chief of Staff, Office of the President, Regional Governors, non mayors and chairpersons of area councils, service chiefs, leaders of political parties, senior government officials, venerable religious leaders, our distinguished invited guests, the press, and all other protocols duly observed. Honorable members, in accordance with Section 77.1 of the 1997 Constitution and Order 21 of the Standing Orders, His Excellency Adam Abaro, President of the Republic of the Gambia, is here today to attend and address a session of the National Assembly on the condition of the Gambia, the policies of the government, and the administration of the state. 2024 legislative year. We are here together as a nation to witness a significant event in the life of our democracy. That is the President's State of the Nation Address. In this regard, I wish to extend on behalf of both sides of the Assembly a warm welcome to His Excellency the President to this hallowed chamber. Your Excellency, we are deeply honored by your presence and look forward to your insightful address. You can provide us with an overview of the current state of foundation, the progress we have made, and the promises and challenges that lie ahead. Honorable members, His Excellency's presence in this assembly today is also, is also significant in our parliamentary calendar. It enables honorable members of the legislature to have the opportunity to hear from the head of the executive on the condition of the Gambia, the policies of the government, and the administration of the state. Traditionally, this particular sitting of the assembly attracts Gambians and people from all walks of life. Therefore, on behalf of both sides of the assembly, I welcome you all. Your presence 
underscores the importance of this occasion and the collective commitment we share in shaping the future of our country. On that note, honorable members, I wish to once again welcome His Excellency the President to the National Assembly in fulfillment of his constitutional mandate. I thank you all. Clerk, can we proceed? Motion, State of the Nation Address 2024 by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia. Honorable members, I have the singular honor and privilege to invite His Excellency, President Adam Abaro, President of the Republic of the Gambia, to deliver his speech. Your Excellency. Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Members of the National Assembly, Your Excellency, the Vice President, Your Worship, the Chief Justice of the Gambia, Excellencies, former Vice Presidents, Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic and the Council of Corps, senior public officials and service chiefs, party leaders, honorable religious leaders, distinguished personalities, ladies and gentlemen. In accordance with section 77.1 of the Constitution, my own address this August body on the country's current state of affairs. The address provides an update on my administration's performance during the 2023 calendar year, with focus on government policies, programs, legislative frameworks, and plans for the future. This link to our national plans and the influence of global developments on the nation. Departing from the traditional sector-by-sector -sector presentation, my address today is thematized around the productive and social sectors respectively. So this concise box gives a clear picture of the nation's development trend. With this short introduction, I will proceed to briefly situate our foreign policy within the global context, the Gambia's foreign policy context. Honorable Speaker, we are in trying circumstances globally, facing geopolitical events that breed distrust, enmity, and mounting despair to generate unified action for global peace and stability. There is widespread unrest around the globe, and the presence of jihadists, terrorists, and rebels in the Sahel and in other parts of Africa continues to undermine progress towards democracy and development on the continent. West Africa in particular have recently experienced mixed fortunes with democratic transitions in Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and lately Senegal. In contrast, military disruptions in Guinea Conakry, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali have threatened constitutional order in the region. Linking the international context to our national circumstances. With specific reference to our foreign policy, the Gambia remains committed to tackling global challenges to reinforce multilateralism, democracy, 
and promotion of global solidarity to safeguard our sovereignty and socio-economic ambitions. My government will steadfastly promote a foreign policy aligned with our national interests. Specifically, keen focus will remain cast on debt relief, climate financing, equitable trade, and fulfillment of the sustainable development goals to ensure prosperity. Above all, security, peace, stability, and development will remain at the center of our engagements. Mr. Speaker, our resolve is to intensify engagements with global and regional bodies such as the UN, AU, ECOWAS, and the OIC to achieve our national development goals. In the process, we will pursue the renewal of the Gambia's membership in the United Nations Human Rights Council and the African Union Peace and Security Council for two years. As evidence of our increasingly successful foreign policy, the UN Secretary General has declared the Gambia eligible to continue receiving funding amounting to 30 million US dollars from the UN Peace Building Commission for an order five years. Closely related to our international visibility is the 15th OIC summit we successfully hosted last month, during which I became chairman of the organization for the next three years. The summit, ha the summit has, ad has added great impetus to our international prominence. I re echo my gratitude to all Gambians and international partners who contributed to the successful hosting of the summit. Proudly for us, the event was rated as one of the most successful summits in the history of the organization. At the bilateral level, we aim to deepen relationships with our partners and explore new forms that would benefit the nation. The establishment of two new embassies in Europe and one in Asia as approved by this distinguished assembly is a move in that direction. As confirmation of our growing friendship and bilateral relations around the world, 30 diplomats presented their letters of credence to me during last year. In strengthening good neighborliness, we hosted the third biannual Senegal or Gambian Presidential Council in August 2023 and the maiden walking visit of the new Senegalese president last April. Honorable Speaker, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in the process of validating its draft foreign service regulation and draft posting policy. In addition to a foreign service bill, which will be submitted to the cabinet for review and approval. These are part of broader efforts to reposition our foreign policy streamline foreign service operations and enhance the professionalism and efficiency of our foreign service. Our objective at home and abroad would fail without a strong economy, reliable human resource, and the required infrastructure programs and development efforts. I will therefore turn attention to the economy before moving onto the productive sector that sustains it. The economy, Honorable Speaker. In 2023, the Gambian economy surpassed the projected growth rate for Sub Saharan Africa and stood at 5.3%. This resulted from our commitment to economic growth and prosperity, reducing inflation and our debt vulnerability while maintaining prudent fiscal policy. Over the years, we have been implementing a series of public financial management reforms. These are reflected in such initiatives as the update, updating of the 2014 Public Finance Act and formulation of a new public procurement bill. We have also rolled out the integrated financial management information systems 
if means to all local government authorities created created the state owned enterprise commission and enacted the anti corruption act 2023 the reforms seek to increase physical transparency and accountability as a welcome development the international monetary fund has approved a new 100 million us dollar extended credit facility arrangement with the gambia thereby further supporting our economic recovery and structural reforms in addition different from the 25 million us dollars threshold program to support our electricity and river transport development endeavors the gambia has been selected to develop a 300 million us dollar development compact with the united states through its mcc strategically we recently launched a 1 billion us dollar recovery focus national development plan irwa 2023-2027, which builds on the progress made during my first term in office. I am optimistic that the economy will continue to grow stronger. Agriculture and natural resources, honorable speaker. Agriculture and our natural resources are crucially important feeders of our economy. As one of the productive sectors, agriculture in the country did not perform badly in 2023 season. It benefited from a favorable weather and timely government interventions, such as provision of free plowing services, free seeds, and heavily subsidized fertilizers for many farmers. Consequently, cereal production increased by 21% rice by 27 percent maize by 25 percent millet by 14 percent and sorghum by 17 percent the cash crops also increase those groundnuts by 12 percent cow pigs by 26 percent findo by 9 percent and sesame by 6 percent in all last year agriculture contributed 25.5 percent of the gdp this indicates a slight decrease from 25.7% in 2022, translating into a decrease of 0.2 percentage points. In the 2023-2024 season, the government allocated $1.5 billion for purchase of grounds, acquiring about 38,669 metric tons. This marked a significant increase over 10,000 metric tons purchased in the previous season. Looking ahead to the 2024-25 cropping season, we plan to bring 5,000 hectares on the rice cultivation, a target that could rise substantially if 10 registered commercial farmers in the scheme commence cultivation. In support of the National Food Security Drive, government will procure 180 tractors and 20 rotavator boards for year-round deployment. Additionally, additionally, we will enhance rice processing within the country's irrigated hubs through irrigated equipment training processes and expanding irrigation facilities. This year, my government will distribute rice, groundnut, maize, and bean seeds to farmers to help them boost production. There is already enough fertilizer in country, and it will be sold to the farmers at a subsidized price at different locations across the country. To improve financial exclusivity, we plan to extend matching grant funds to microfinance institutions that operate close to the communities at grassroots levels. We also plan to integrate modern technologies like ICT to, for internet banking and mobile phones into the farming communities and establish a, at least five agricultural insurance schemes to mitigate risks in agricultural lending. These schemes will, manage, will be managed through public-private partnership. Among many other interventions, the Gambia Agricultural Transformation Program, which seeks to bolster food and nutrition security 
through sustainable management of our natural resources will strengthen both the public and private sector across the agricultural value chain. Fisheries and water resources, honorable speak. This is an other productive sector that contributes to the economy. Due to several factors, however, the total revenue collected from the fisheries sector decreased from 100 and $31,595,269 in 2022 to $110,802,912 in 2023, representing a decrease of $20,792,357, or about 15.8%. To get the most from the sector, my government is actively reviewing its fishing licensing regime to increase protection for additional fishers and ensure fair and sustainable management of our fisheries resources. Consequently, the Ministry of Fisheries, Water Resources and Natural, National Assembly Matters has initiated the construction of 20 fishing boats with fishing equipment to enhance the livelihood of the youth and women and reduce illegal migration. Also, the Ministry is constructing fish ponds in Kuloro through a funding partnership with the EU to boost fish production. The 25 million US dollars Climate Resilience Fishery Initiative for the Livelihood Improvement Project funded by the Green Climate Fund aims to conserve and protect fisheries resources while strengthening the climate resilience of fishing communities. To minimize post-harvest losses and promote the hygiene and quality fish products. During the period under review, the Ministry built two fishing landing platforms in Gunjur and Tanje and constructed access roads linking these sites to markets. Mr. Speaker, the Gambia has made significant strides in improving equitable access to safe drinking water, with 90% of the population provided with better water resources in 2023. up from 86% in 2010. I must observe, however, the figure stands at 83% in rural areas. Additional efforts are needed to bridge the gap by increasing access to safe drinking water in our rural communities. In particular, last year, we implemented a mini borehole drilling project with a budget of $10 million for the government local fund, from the government local fund. Fifteen communities now have access to safe and high-quality drinking water through the project. In collaboration with the African Development Bank Group and Japan, my government targets to install 130 large solar-powered pipe water systems to benefit 162 communities and an estimated 280,000 people. To this end, 20 boreholes were inaugurated in December 2023, 55 have been installed, and the remaining 55 will be completed in 2025. My government will not relent in sustaining these efforts. Transport, walls, and infrastructure, Honorable speak. <clears throat> Inspired by the principle that roads connect people and foster prosperity, our commitment to develop comprehensive transport infrastructure remains unwavering. In accordance with our Recovery Focus National Development Plan, RFNDP, significant progress has been made in both urban and rural roads development. The Barton Harding Highway and its feeder roads, for example, are near completion. The rural roads program stretching 365 kilometers and fully funded by the national budget is advancing smoothly. In 2023, Mr. Speaker, we completed the Salum, Nyanigya, and Sabasanjal roads. By the end of 2024, we expect to complete Kiang West roads, Nyomi Hakalang, and a significant portion of the 365 kilometer of roads nationwide. On water transportation, we are concluding a concession contract 
with Albrecht Company Limited, which will further enhance port efficiency. The contract includes develop development of a new deep sea port in Sanya. Apart from refurbishing all ferries, we have procured two new ferries and are awaiting their delivery. This initiative, this initiative will guarantee reliable and safe ferry services on the Banjun Bara route. In addition, we have partnered with the private sector to upgrade the Banjun shipyard to support the ferries as well as other craft and industrial fishing vessels. This will contribute to boosting skills development and job opportunities. The transport sector contributes significantly to the economy. The Gambia Port Authority, for instance, recorded revenue collection of 1.1 billion 563 million dollars in 2023, representing a 2% increase over 1 billion 534 million dollars is collected in 2023. Similarly, the authority registered a 20.4% increment in its gross profit in 2023 of 1 billion 199 million dollars compared to 996 million 134 million in 2022. <clears throat> Unfortunately, due to high operational costs and the negative impact of the exchange rate on the authority's revenue, a marginal increase of just 2% in revenue was recorded for the year. Honorable Speaker, <clears throat> in the area of aviation and maritime operations, aside from undertaking comprehensive reforms to align operations with international standards and best practice, we are inviting our human capital for a viable skilled workforce. In this respect, 23 students are currently sponsored at the Regional Maritime University in Ghana, studying various engineering fields. All the first cohort of students graduated with distinction. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, to conclude, the Gambia Transport Service Company has significantly improved public transport, offering safe, affordable, and reliable transportation options across the country. Tourism and culture, Honorable Speaker. <clears throat> the tourism sector has demonstrated remarkable resilience growing in tourism arrivals over the past three years and making a significant contribution to the Gambia's economic development. In 2023, there was a 13% increase in tourism arrival, totaling to 206,836 compared to 182,795 in 2022. The increase in arrival has translated into revenue increase from 168.19 million in 2022 to 333.12 million in 2023. This reflects a robust recovery and growth in the sector. In view of the importance of the tourism sector. We will not relent in improving our promotion strategies, infrastructure, products, and service to improve access to major hotels along the tourism development area. Therefore, three road projects are near completion. Other plans include further promoting community-based ecotourism and domestic tourism. In the cultural sector, the Ministry of Tourism established the National Endowment Fund for Arts and Culture in 2023. Following cabinet endorsement, the fund will be operational in 2024 to provide a steady source of support for Gambians' arts and culture programs. On legislation, the Gambia has ratified two major UNESCO conventions, namely the 2001 Convention on the Protection of, Protection of Underwater Heritage and the 1970 Convention Against Illicit Transfer of Cultural Goods. Both became effective on 10 February 2024. Trade, industry, regional integration, and employment. Honorable Speaker, through the Ministry of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration, and Employment, my administration remains committed to enhancing trade 
fostering private sector development, propelling industrialization, and ensuring the effective functioning of the labor market. Recent measures to mitigate external shocks does include stabilizing prices and ensuring the availability of essential food commodities. Furthermore, we now give priority to vessels carrying essential goods to avoid undue charges and we provide subsidies for flour and fuel. We also engage with the central bank to ensure foreign exchange availability for essential commodity suppliers. In 2023, the administration negotiated with the government of India and secured a waiver for rice imports on a concessional basis with a new extension granted for 2024. This incorporates an allocated quota of 150,000 metric tons of the of, of, of for the Gambia. Discussions to include sugar in this waiver support are progressive. In collaboration with the Ministry of Finance, in the country secured a 50 million US dollar trade finance facility from Badia to support the importation of essential food commodities and fuel. The facility is to facilitate continuous availability and affordability of these commodities. Mr. Speaker, the People's Republic of China granted the Gambia duty-free quota free market access in 2017 for products like groundnuts, cashew, sesame fish, and cassava. In 2023, this coverage was extended to include 98% of the Chinese tariff. To take advantage of the African continental free trade area, we have launched the green industrial transportation transformation through special economic zones and agropoles program. The objective is to establish a climate resilient, sustainable special economic zone and three agropoles to accelerate manufacturing and agricultural transformation. I am happy to add that there is funding from the African Development Bank for a feasibility study to establish a special economic zone along the Senegambia Bridge. An Indian consulting firm has been recruited to conduct the study. Also, we have secured 100,000 US dollars from the ECOWAS Commission to modernize the Wellingaraba Lumo for cross-border trade facilitation. In the area of industrialization, the construction of a facial economic zone along the Senegambia Bridge Corridor is underway, with significant investments projected to create over 1,000 jobs. In the same vein, the Gambia Standards Bureau has developed over 100 national standards to improve market access for Gambian products, and a food testing laboratory is under construction to support national quality infrastructure. The, the government has also launched the new employment policy 2023-2028 and enacted a revised labor act to enhance employment conditions and productivity. This effort reflects our commitment to strengthening the economy, protecting consumer rights, and ensuring fair competition. Beside this act, there is a legal methodology bill to replace the Ways and Measures Act of 1977. Mr. Speaker, the Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Corporation administered 116 consumer cases in 2023 and recover substantial amount of money through its alternative dispute resolution mechanism. Despite this, there are plans to amend the Competition and Consumer Protection Act and develop a major review regulation framework. Relative to employment, a national labor force survey to assess employment trends and challenges that have, that have been conducted. We are equally working hard to equip our youth and essential skills for gainful employment and entrepreneurship. <laughs> Likewise, we have signed bilateral agreements with Saudi Arabia and the UAE to facilitate, secure, and transparent employment opportunities for our youth abroad. These efforts are aimed at building our trade capacity, improving labor market conditions, and supporting the nation's economic growth. They will also contribute to realizing 
our target of creating 150,000 jobs opportunities over a five-year period. Petroleum and Energy, Honorable Speaker. The Ministry of Petroleum and Energy has been actively engaged in issues of access, affordability, and sustainable utilization of energy resources to regulation and various programs and projects. Inspired by the government's Energy Roadmap 2021-2040, the National Water and Electricity Company, NAVEC, has embarked on transforming energy and water provision nationwide. The roadmap targets universal access to electricity by 2025, including specific national integrated water resources management targets. Notably, NAVEC is implementing a significant electricity access project to connect over 800 communities across the country to electricity. In the major development for the Gambia's energy sector, the company commissioned a 23 megawatt solar power plant in Jamburi. This significant addition to the grid is expected to generate more clean energy and reduce operational costs. In the geological sector, the focus remains on the sustainable use of mineral resources essential for the construction industry. Specifically, the demand for sand in 2023 exceeded 1 million cubic meters due to extensive infrastructural development. Although the mining sector generated 172 million 962,922 dollars as revenue during the reporting period, sand, gravel, and other heavy mineral concentrates contributed significantly to this achievement. The Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, continues to pursue energy security by exploring and developing the country's petroleum resources. It has engaged in power purchase agreement and partnership for crude oil exploration and capacity development with entities like the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation and Guinea Conakry SONAP. GNPC is also participating in the Nigeria Morocco Gas Pipeline project, which aims to utilize, utilize West Africa's natural gas resources and provide alternative export routes to Europe. We assure that the government will continue to pursue the profitable utilization of the country's energy and geological resources. Pertaining to water provision, a major water project under the OIC infrastructure development program value at 22.5 million U.S. dollars, seek to increase water production accessibility to underserved areas. This initiative is aligned with the global goal on access to clean and safe drinking water. Still, NAVEC is implementing an emergency water project funded by the World Bank for 13 million U.S. dollars. The project incorporates drilling boreholes to expand water access in the Greater Banjun area and the North Bank region. Environment, climate change, and natural resources, Honorable Speaker. On climate risk management, the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change, and Natural Resources is currently developing a legal framework to oversee the carbon trading market in the Gambia, aiming to better manage climate risk. In this regard, the Environmental Impact Assessment Program is to ensure that projects undergo environmental and social screening before implementation. The NEA remains steadfast in taking the lead to protect the environment and asserting the security of everyone in the country. To succeed, the agency is completing a state-of-the-art laboratory to analyze chemical and soil samples among other functions. The facility will support informed decision-making and timely action to protect the environment and public health. Recent cabinet approvals include the NEMA Amendment Bill 2022, 
the hazardous chemicals and pesticide management act, um, um, amendment bill and the waste bill. Their enactment will significantly strengthen efforts to tackle environmental challenges. The forestry and wildlife management. The Department of Forestry has uh, supported 620 communities to enter into preliminary community forest management agreements. This has increased the total on the community schemes for 45,237 hectares. In line with my government's position on planting trees, efforts in this area extended to seed distribution of indigenous tree species and the planting of 468,617 trees across the country. Overall, there has been a significant expansion of protected areas in the country and the destination of the fourth man biosphere reserve is awaiting UNESCO approval. Added to this, the EU Life Project has been approved for implementation in 2024. Complementing this initiative is an ongoing large-scale mangrove restoration project in various regions. These comprehensive measures reflect the government's devotion to environmental stewardship and sustainable development. Population and social protection, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Through the Office of the Vice President, our national population policy has been updated and a strategic plan for 2024-2028 developed. The policy is to leverage the Gambia's youthful population for economic growth and sustainable development. In light with UWA, the Sustainable Development Goals and AU Agenda 2063. Mr. Speaker, the National Population Bill, which is crucial for establishing the Commission in Secretariat and Observatory, has Cabinet approval for submission to this Assembly. The National Social Protection Secretariat, NSPS, has contributed the development of the Gambia Social Registry. This is an integrated database enhancing social protection services by effectively supporting the poor and vulnerable. The system has already facilitated identification of beneficiaries for five significant programs. Among these are the Flashing NAFA Cash Transfer Intervention and the World Food Program 2023 Lean Season Response. Happily, the Gambia Social Registry is transforming social protection services to the people, and we hope to achieve nationwide coverage by the end of the year. Even at this early stage, the registry has supported eight programs that include those run by NGOs, development partners, and various government ministries and departments. Honorable Speaker, let me officially announce the government-funded initiative of mainstreaming social assistance to vulnerable households through the Family Strengthening Program. The NSPS has led this groundbreaking initiative through a group of multi-government stakeholders. The program aims to enhance both the welfare of our citizens by increasing access to essential goods and services and fostering investments in human and productive capital. Currently, over 2,000 people benefit from the program, leaving no one behind. To lay the foundation for a sustainable social assistance sector, the National Social Protection Bill, now with the legislature, is to establish a robust framework on social protection rights through a social protection fund that will expand government support to the most vulnerable groups. Following the 2019 agreement with ECOWAS, the establishment of the National Early Warning and Response Mechanism Coordinating Center has been initiated under the Vice President's Office. A bill to formalize it will be presented to the National Assembly. With Cabinet approval of the National Nutrition Policy 2021-2025, the National Nutrition Agency, supported by UNICEF and the World Food Program, has formulated a common resource framework to monitor nutrition programs and activities. In addition, to, conduct, to, to combat micronutrient deficiencies, the National Nutrition Agency launched 
a food fortification and biofortification strategy that targets critical deficiencies among women of childbearing age and children under five. Last year, the NAFA program under the Gambia Social Safety Net supported, supported by 30 million US dollars grant from the World Bank ended successfully with a significant impact. It has benefited 16,966 households across the poorest districts. To build on this success, the program will be expanded to include an additional 20,000 households. To protect public health and facilitate both national and international food trade, the Food Security and Quality Assurance is implementing its decentralization strategy by deploying food inspectors and safety officers at all, at all national border points to ensure food safety in the country. A comprehensive country-wide food control system has thus been established. Mr. Speaker, the National Disaster Management Agency, NDMA, recently updated the National Disaster Management Policy and Strategy to address disaster risk. Preparedness activities, including drainage, cleaning, and waterway dredging are underway in flood-prone areas. Last year, NDMA in completed cars NDMA completed cash transfer to households affected by mild drought and collaborated with WFP to improve essential food supplies to disaster affected and food insecure households during the lean season, land, regional government, and religious affairs. Honorable Speaker, land administration is indeed a matter of great concern to my government. We continue to have land disputes around the country that trigger tension and chaos. The trouble that erupted in Bunjur and Manduar and the land disputes in CRR and URR are typical examples. In the same way, the destruction of forest land and reserve or protected sensitive wetlands threaten the peace in some communities. Equally troubling are the communal boundaries and international border tension does requiring attention. All these have a negative impact on our flora and fauna in accordance with the uh, Banjun Declaration of 1977. Accordingly, the Ministry of Lands, Regional Government and Religious Affairs, with assistance from the World Bank, is formulating the country's first ever national land policy. The policy will the policy will introduce a land tenure system to ensure tenure security, equitable land access, and promote sustainable use of land resources. Also, it is designed to generate wealth, mitigate poverty, and reinforce resilience against environmental challenges. Environmental changes. In order development, the World Bank has allocated 10 million US dollars to support the development of a gender-sensitive, climate-informed national land policy to guide reforms in land tenure, governance, and administration. Meanwhile, the process has started to develop an automated land resources management system under the West Africa Coastal Area Resilience Project. The scheme is to contribute to diversifying the economy, securing land titles, and resolving ongoing land disputes by creating detailed maps and land use plans. Communication and digital economy. Honorable Speaker. The Ministry of Communication and Digital Economy and stakeholders have formulated policies, strategies and regulations to steer the Gambia's digital evolution. Key instruments developed so far range from the Digital Economy Master Plan 2023, the Digital Addressing Policy, Fiber Protection Policy, and Open Data Policy to a Digital Strategy. For enhanced security and compliance, a registration system is equally in place to ensure that only authentic devices operate within the country. In collaboration with the Public Utilities and Regulatory Agency and the Gambia Revenue Authority, we have engaged SIGPA, a company in South Africa, to implement a revenue assurance and tariff monitoring system. This system is to guarantee 
accurate taxation on both international and local voice traffic, including value-added services. Significant progress in e-government initiative has been made with the support of the World Bank through the West, African, Africa, West Africa Digital Integration Program. This involves rolling out a second submarine cable to speed up connectivity and provide crucial international redundancy for the Gambia. I have mandated the upgrading and rolling out of a national digital ID system which will harmonize identification systems within the country and assign a unique identifier to every Gambia. The exercise will coincide with the expiration of the current ID card and driver's licensing scheme. Mr. Speaker, this year we plan to present the Malabo Convention to the National Assembly for Ratification. Once enacted, it will strengthen collaboration to manage cross-border cyber security. To reposition GAM, GAMTEL and GAMSEL to achieve the target set by national broadband strategy and policy, the World Bank has agreed to support the transition to allow private sector participation in the management and operation of GAMTEL through a special proposed vehicle partnership and outright sale of GAMSEL. Cabinet has accepted this public-private partnership arrangement and will appoint a, trans a transaction advisor to assist the government during the transaction pro process. Information, Honorable Speaker, as required in Section 41 of the Access to Information ATI Act 2021, the process of appointing information commissioners is in progress, subject to confirmation by the National Assembly. Five distinguished Gambians have been appointed. The, these appointments are necessary for the effective implementation of the ATI Act, which aim to address transparency and accountability issues. Our goal is to operationalize the Information Commission this year. Mr. Speaker, equally important is the Personal Data Protection and Privacy Bill 2023. It has Cabinet approval and will be tabled here shortly. This bill is essential for regulating personal data processing and protecting the rights and privacy of individuals. When currently the government is drafting the Information Media and Broadcasting Bill, IMB 2024, among other objectives, it is to institute inclusively consultation and partnership with media establishments, both public and private. The bill will repeal the Information and Communication Act 2009. In the area of regulation, Mr. Speaker, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority and the Ministry are, finished, are, are finalizing the Broadcasting Contents Regulation 2024. These regulations pending the enactment of the IMB Bill 2024 will promote responsible broadcasting practices and ensure compliance with existing laws. Once published, it is expected to play a significant role in shaping broadcasting standards in the Gambia. During the course of the year, the Ministry introduced a public engagement and popularization of the Government Agenda Initiative. This content development and multimedia broadcasting initiative is to foster constructive national dialogue on national socio-economic development matters. Public Service. Honorable Speaker, the Ministry of Public Service is undertaking a comprehensive review of the functions of ministries, departments, and agencies, MDS, to identify institutional overlaps, competing mandates, and redundancies. Based on the employees of the government, ministries, and departments, the civil service is 49,893 strong, 27,940 are male, while 21,953 are female an estimated total of 83,155 employees are in the entire public service. There are 8,427 vacant positions across the ministries. Most of them are in the ministries of Interior, Defense, and Health. The primary challenges in filling these vacancies 
include the lengthy recruitment process in the security sector and a shortage of qualified personnel in the health sector. The e-recruitment system also posed initial challenges, but it has since been improved. The Ministry continues to implement the civil service reform program through various strategies and approaches, principally for effective management of the public service review of the Public Service Act 1991 is at the tail end. Mr. Speaker, the Civil Service Reform Program 2018-2027 is to devise a standard personal administration system and maintain discipline and ethical conduct in the civil service. Furthermore, it is to maintain proper remuneration packages and incentives for the civil servants, build adequate capacity for performance and accountability within the civil service, and institutionalize a meritocracy. In this direction, a major reform undertaken is the centralization of pension administration under the PMO, as mandated by the Public Service Pension Act of 2022. As part of the reform program, the PMO is actively collaborating with stakeholders to enhance public service performance and service delivery through installation of biometric time attendance machines across all MDS. This is to monitor attendance to address lateness and unauthorized absence from work. In its endeavor to build capacity and strengthen the civil service, the PMO awards scholarships to civil servants to address critical skills and knowledge gap, gaps within the public service. Aligned with the recovery focus, NDP, the ministry regularly hosts quarterly retreats for permanent secretaries to reinforce interdepartmental coordination. Beyond this, the program for accelerated community development coordinated by the Department of Strategy, Policy and Delivery in collaboration with the, U with the UNDP was launched to deliver essential services to rural communities targeting clean water, electricity and agricultural resources in, 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 pro in progressing. It's progressing. This initiative is an offshoot of our commitment to, in, in, to, to inclusive development as outlined in the Recovery Focus National Development Plan 2023-2027 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Honorable Speaker, the Department of Strategy, Policy and Delivery works with the Office in, the ex in executing my oversight responsibilities through the National Economic Council and Presidential Delivery Forums. This internal accountability mechanism ensures effective and efficient service delivery. Honorable Speaker, all these initiatives are to make sure that the MDA is delivered as expected. The regular MDA presentations conduct in my office is evidence of this commitment. The, government, the government's objective is to create a more effective and efficient public service system that can meet the needs of our citizens and propel the nation's development forward. National security. Mr. Speaker, as a nation, our survival and progress depend on our security and peace. Hence the significance of the ongoing security sector reform SSR. I am pleased to state that the SRR is progressive and we are committed to seeing it through. The Office of the National Security, through the National Security Advisor, appointed to coordinate all security institutions, leads the SSR. So far, the Office has coordinated new policies and strategies that include 17 policing policies and standard operating procedures. The Police Act of 1949 has been updated and the new strategic frameworks formulated, so as the National Security Policy, National Security Council Bill, National Security Strategy, Security Sector Reform Strategy, and National Defense Policy. The GAF policy has also been revised. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, a draft veterans policy is now available to honor our veterans and attend to their concerns. For those in active service, there is a revised version of the terms and conditions of service for soldiers and officers. 
Later this year, my government will submit the arms treaty, uh, the arms trade treaty instrument for accession to the United Nations Agency for membership. Alongside these developments, an immigration service bill is on the way to enhance border control and management. This is to be supported by significant technological investments that include the Migration Information and Data Analysis System. The draft bill for the Gambia Fire and Rescue Service aimed at enhancing rescue and fire fighting capabilities is also lined up for enactment. The indication is that these comprehensive reforms have led to a significant reduction in human rights violations and abuses. Honorable Speaker, on the crime rate, whereas 4,894 crime cases were recorded in 2022, 4,567 were recorded in 2023, making a decrease of 6.6 percent. Out of these 349 major crimes were recorded in 2022 and 272 in 2023, implying a decrease of about 22 percent. The decrease cuts across all crimes. In 2022, 1,000 and two traffic cases were registered, with 922, 922 registered in 2023. The decline is linked to increased police vigilance and community policing strategies. Notwithstanding the decline in trend recorded during the last two years, the crime rate remains a grave concern to my government. The security services have been charged to be more vigilant. Hence, a highway patrol mechanism using modern, modern technology is in place around the Greater Banjun area. Mr. Speaker, in 2023, we inaugurated four model police stations fully equipped with modern equipment and constructed 52 new accommodation rooms for the military in Farafeni. All were fully funded by government. To complement these efforts, we have commissioned two naval vessels, one funded by the government of the Gambia and an other donated by the Kingdom of Spain. This development has facilitated collaboration with the Republic of Senegal to combat cross-border crimes. Mr. Speaker, the Gambia Immigration Department reported a significant increase in revenue performance in 2023, collecting over $200 million as opposed to $104 million 407,130 in 2022. The increase certainly indicates improved financial management and a more effective monitoring system. I must observe, nonetheless, that mitigate, mitigation remains a critical matter globally. My government is thus exploring legal pathways for Gambian migrants through bilateral labor migration cooperation. I am grateful to the Gambian diaspora for their significant contributions to national development. Remittances in 2023 equal 735 million US dollars. These funds contributed to supporting families back home and contributed to our national development efforts. Moving on, our stance against drug abuse is underscored by impressive seizures and convictions achieved by the Drug Law Enforcement Agency. The agency is working actively with partners to establish a rehabilitation center and has launched a drug demand reduction program to, to, to educate the people, particularly young persons, on dangers of drug abuse. In the correctional system, plans are on the way to close the Mile 2 prison property and integrate it into the Banjun Port area. The entity will be transferred to Josuang or relocate to a new site in the Greater Banjun area. This is in, in accordance with the TRRC recommendations and various human rights reports. Women, children, and social welfare, Honorable Speaker. In 2023, the gender, women, and social welfare sector made substantial progress in several critical areas. They constructed shelter support services in Bakote to temporarily house survivors of gender-based violence, GBV. 
to accompany this, a GVV and Child Protection Helpline 199 has been integrated with the Gender Management Information System. In addition, the government has introduced a victim support form to facilitate the rescue, rehabilitation and reintegration of victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Mr. Speaker, my administration has reinforced the legal framework to protect the rights of women, girls and persons with disability through several acts. In 2023, we established special courts specifically to handle cases related to child custody and other child-related issues. In monetary terms, the Ministry of Gender, Women and Social Welfare, in collaboration with the National Social Protection Secretariat, has rolled out has rolled out the government-funded initiative of mainstreaming social assistance amounting to $30 million. Earlier this year alone, the Women Enterprise Fund distributed funds to 8,400 women across the West Coast region, North Bank region, and Central River region. Also, financial assistance was extended to persons with disability from the Disability Fund. Honorable Speaker, not worthy is the private member bill to repeal the Women's Amendment Act 2015 currently under review by the legislature. While awaiting its outcome, government remains committed to enforcing the prohibition of FGM in the government. <laughs> Moving forward, in 2024, we plan to expand the special court for children to handle more cases and set up a forensic lab dedicated to processing evidence in SGBV cases, specifically for rape. To oppose women effective participation, I entreat the National Assembly to approve the private member bill which advocates a 30 percent governance quota for affirmative action. These efforts demonstrate our dedication to transforming the social welfare landscape by creating safer and more equitable space for women and children in the Gambia. Education, Honorable Speaker, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Education and skills acquisition are fundamental rights for every citizen. Therefore, my government places a high priority on the delivery of educational services. On progress made from 2022 to 2023, we register significant infrastructure growth including the construction of over 775 new classrooms and 1,030 toilets for both conventional and non-conventional schools. This expansion is geared towards making quality education affordable and accessible nationwide. Mr. Speaker, added to 12 new senior secondary schools established across the country, classrooms and facilities were rehabilitated in 10 schools from 2022 to 2024. There is a notable increase in enrollment, with enrollment at the early childhood care and development level rising from 130,952 in 2022 to 136,283 in 2023. Similarly, enrollment at all levels have all shown upward trends. We are grateful for the partnership with organizations such as the MRC Holland Foundation, the World Bank, and various UN agencies. Honorable Speaker, over the past three academic years, our poor secondary institutions, including Tibet centers, recorded significant enrollment increase. In 2022, enrollment reached 36,791 students, compared to 34,894 in 2021 although it dropped slightly in 2023 to 35,272, it, it still remained robust. Linked to this recently, I launched the Skill Innovation and Entrepreneurship SIE Fund to train our young people to utilize technical skills learned from the classroom in it's, it's suitable for business ventures. Mr. Speaker, the number of graduates from our public institution continues to increase in view, of the, in view of the increase in the number of higher education institutions in the country. The University of the Gambia alone 
impressively graduated 1,321 students in 2022 and 1,329 in 2023. Of course, its capacity to increase enrollment is constrained by several factors. The government supports students through scholarships, both within the country and abroad. In 2023, we supported 1,591 students with scholarships. This far, in 2024, we have already awarded 655 additional scholarships, totaling to 2,246 to promote equitable access to higher education opportunities. And so sustainable financing, a student loan scheme, research and innovation fund, and a tertiary and higher education trust fund will be rolled out soon. Each of them have cabinet approval and will be presented to this August Assembly. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, my administration has increased access to quality tertiary and higher education while promoting research, science, technology and innovation. The Ndemban and Canalized Skills Training Centers are now in operation. They offer skills training in relevant areas and students receive government scholarships to ease the financial burden on their parents. Despite these achievements, plans are underway to open additional skill centers across the country to meet the skills need at, at regional level and support local development. Honorable Speaker, significant strides have also been made in infrastructure development. The University of the Gambia, the, the University of the Gambia, Faraba. science, engineering, and technology is expected. Legal and judicial matters. Honorable Speaker, since 2017, my administration has embarked on significant legal reforms. Our efforts include introducing a new constitution, and we remain committed to pursuing it this year. It is hoped that a referendum on the new constitution will be held in December 2024. Mr. Speaker, among items of legislation enacted in 2023 is the anti-corruption bill, apart from robust frameworks to criminalize corrupt practices. Specialized, specialized anti-corruption agencies have been strengthened to effectively enforce the law on corruption. The Victim Reparation Act aims at providing reparations to victims of human rights violations from the past regime has been enacted to ensure integrity and accountability in government. So has the ban from Public Office Act been enacted to prevent individuals convicted of corruption or related offenses from holding public office. The former President's Act also enacted acknowledges the services of the nation's former leaders. It provides for their dignified post-presidential life while balancing it with the interests of the Gambian people. Honorable Speaker, an other piece of legislation is the Commission of Inquiry Amendment Act 2023 to conduct thorough investigations and ensure justice and accountability within government. Several other bills are now under consideration. Among them are the Criminal Offenses Bill and the Criminal Procedure Court Bill. Both are vital in building a more transparent and accountable society. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Justice is acting on the TRRC recommendations, particularly through the drafting of the Special Accountability Mechanism Bill and the Special Prosecutor's Office Bill. These bills are part of a broader strategy to establish a hybrid court in collaboration with ECOWAS. The court will apply both domestic and international law to TRRC cases. The establishment of the Special Criminal Division of the High Court, staffed by distinguished Gambian judges, marks a huge step towards presiding over TRRC-related cases impartially and effectively. As we continue to strengthen our legal and judicial systems, my government remains resolute in its commitment to upholding the rule of law and ensure justice for all Gambians. Youth and sports, Honorable Speaker, one of our objectives is to guide 
our youth towards entrepreneurship, employability, and leadership, foster widespread community and national sports participation, and strive for sportless international engagements. The period under review marks significant strife in this direction. The revision of several legislative frameworks and policies and the effective coordination of related programs across the nation via satellite institutions are notable aspects of this drive. On further legislative efforts, with support from the UN Peace Building Fund, the Ministry of Youth and Sports and their stakeholders have reviewed key acts and developed the new Gambia Sports Bill and Youth Bill alongside proposed amendments to other existing acts. This will be presented to the National Assembly. The Youth and Sports Development Levy has facilitated the construction of sports facilities in strategic national locations and the implementation of the Youth and Sports Revolving Loan Fund. Several mini stadiums have been inaugurated and there are more construction works and upgrading of facilities in the pipeline. Mr. Speaker, our national teams have proudly represented the nation in recent international competition, participating consecutively in the 2023-2024 African, Af African Cup of Nations and the All Africa Games. We applaud them and wish them well in all future competitions. The Ministry of Youth and Sports is continually initiating skills development and employment opportunities for youth. The National Youth Service Graduate Program launched last August to prepare young graduates for the job market is a clear example. An order is the ongoing training in sustainable farming practices provided by the Gambia Songhai Initiative. In 2023, the President's International Award Scheme celebrated the achievements of 1,650 young recipients. Likewise, we continue to support needy training programs which have benefited over 1,000 young people. The Bagway returnees, many of whom have started or scaled up their businesses, are participants in these programs. Health, Honorable Speaker, without compromising on quality, my administration is delegated to delivering health care services, putting emphasis on primary health care, efficient service delivery, a well-trained health care workforce, and strong health infrastructure. In this direction, we recently inaugurated five new state-of-the-art health facilities in Salikene, Kienjali, Chismajau, Tumana, and Mankamangunda, respectively. Construction of the Nyao Health Center is progressing with satisfaction. With World Bank support, works are in progress on the National Food and Drug Quality Control Laboratory at Bruceby, a new biomedical engineering unit, and the National Emergency Treatment Center in Farato. Completion is expected this year. On a separate development, my government has allocated $250 million to procure essential medicines to readily ensure treatment of, com of common communicable diseases, especially for maternal and child health. This aside, we continue to collaborate with the Global Fund to combat HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Accordingly, we have successfully secured a grant of 23, 23,415,791 US dollars to fight these diseases and to strengthen the health system from January 2024 to December 2026, thereby continuing efforts to fight HIV and AIDS. From December 2026, thereby continuing efforts from the 2022-2023 funding cycle. Similarly, the Global Fund has committed $2.4 million to support the installation of a CT scan as part of our health system strengthening initiative. For 2024, an additional grant of $7,859,024 has been awarded to addressing unfunded demands in strategic areas that include tuberculosis mitigation, enhanced surveillance and data systems, oxygen and respiratory care laboratory systems, 
and diagnostic networks as well as community health work programs. As we strive to meet and exceed the healthcare needs of the Gambian population, my government's commitment to enhancing healthcare infrastructure, expanding service delivery, and utilizing international partnerships remains unwavering. Meanwhile, our postgraduate medical and nursing training programs are making a significant difference by strengthening our healthcare workforce. My conclusion, Honorable Speaker, Honorable National Assembly members, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my address clearly portrays a nation that is amazingly recovering from the devastation of a global pandemic that strangled the world economies. A nation in progress and a nation whose development efforts are already yielding resounding results. The address confirms that my administration's development orientation is visibly realistic, widely approved, and hugely far-reaching. The 5.3% economic growth and the positive remarks in the latest World Bank report clearly support these conclusions. The OIC summit, our international ratings on press freedom and human rights, our growing bilateral relations, and the key positions we hold in ECOWAS, AU, and UN vividly demonstrate our acceptance on the world stage and the restoration of the dignity of Gambians internationally. Nationally, the expansion of our development programs and unprecedented achievements in the provision of electricity, construction of roads and access to clean water single out my administration as evidently development oriented. Gambians who never had the privilege of gaining access to electricity, education, health care or water facilities of country now enjoy this right. All these together with the social protection program and other interventions that target the poor and vulnerable testify to our resolve to fight poverty and guarantee equitable distributions of the nation's resources. The scholarship packages, exceptional rise in the graduation rates of Gambians at degree level, the increase in tertiary and higher education institutions, and the corresponding expansion in curricular programs, as well as the employment and training initiatives for the youth and women illustrate our commitment and care for equitable development and participation in the economy. With such commitments, we have implemented well-defined and well-targeted programs that have transformed communities and regions across the country. The first set of roads constructed in the URR right through to the OIC roads are very well conceived and very timely executed projects. In this way, we are translating our national vision into realistic giant development strides. Our experience over the years provides an example of how an under-resourced small state can be rescued from underdevelopment to rapid progress. 
deliver from international isolation to global acceptance and transform from a dictatorship to an acknowledged model of democracy. There is no turning back and no slowing down for us. We are development oriented and consciously guided by the plight and needs and aspirations of the Gambian citizens from whom we derive our legitimacy. We will continue to leverage the advantages that come with friendship and partnerships built within the country and around the world to contribute to global peace and progress while pursuing the interests of the Gambian nation. Honorable Speaker, crime and the cost of living are indeed daunting challenges because crime is a treble hindrance for peace, security and progress. We condemn all types of criminal activities. I assure the nation that we are determined to reduce both crime rate and the rising cost of essential commodities. Although we are aware of the complicities embedded in these two global threats to peace, the consequences of disrupting the peace, stability and development of any community or any nation are obvious. Our progress lies in peace and our togetherness as well as our capacity for development. All that my government solicits, therefore, is that our common identity and development aspiration unite us, commit us to the nation, and force us to work together, regardless of party affiliation, ethnic origin, or religious orientation. Honorable Speaker, I thank you, together with the Deputy Speaker and all the honorable members of this noble assembly, for our legislative achievements and the relationships established among us. I am equally grateful to our development partners, the international community, and the entire Gambian nation, for without their collective support and efforts, we will not come this far. I hope that the spirit of the last national dialogue, the universal tenets of democracy, and our common attributes and values as human beings govern us and keep us together on track towards lasting peace, security, and accelerated <laughs> development for us all. Despite our successes, we will never hit less. No indifference to the concerns and needs of the people. Though steadfastly, we will use our resources, time, and energy to develop the country, raise the standard of living, and strive to meet the basic needs of the population. My belief is that investing today implies securing the future for ourselves and our offspring. Once we have the means to do so, we will continue investing in national development. And so shall we continue partnering with you as legislators to deliver on our development promises to the people. May the Almighty God be our help. I thank you for coming. Honourable Member for Kantora and Majority Leader. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Equally, I rise to second the motion and thank His Excellency for well articulated and comprehensive speech delivered here in the Allah Chamber. Indeed, a true Democrat and defender of human rights. Thank you. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that this assembly do consider the motion on the State of the Nation Address 2024 
delivered by His Excellency the President of the Republic. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. no. The ayes have it. <laughs> Honorable members, the consideration and debate proper on the motion will be adjourned until Monday, 1st July 2024, to give honorable members ample time to read and digest the said address, where the Vice President and Cabinet Ministers are required to, present, to be present to witness the debate on this honor. Before adjourning this sitting, please allow me, on behalf of both sides of the Assembly, and indeed on my own behalf, thank His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia, for his well-delivered and insightful state of the nation address. The address has as provided for in the Constitution. The statement also provided us the opportunity to reflect on the achievements and challenges we face as a nation and the urgent need for national unity, peace and stability to propel the development needs and aspirations of our dear motherland. As the people's representatives, we are tried to do our best to ensure that the policies and programs outlined in, in His Excellency's address are scrutinized and debated with due diligence. It is also important for us to have a clear understanding of the government's policies, development programs, and their aspirations. This will provide the National Assembly and its various committees with tools necessary to perform its legislative scrutiny and oversight functions. On that note, Your Excellency, I thank you once again for addressing this assembly. In the same vein, I wish to express thanks and gratitude to His Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic, my Lord, the Honorable Chief Justice and Justices of the Superior Courts, all Honorable Members, and all distinguished invited guests for gracing this solemn occasion in our parliamentary calendar. By extension, on behalf of both sides of this August Assembly, I also wish to register our gratitude to all Gambians for the support and collaboration in our collective drive towards nation building. May I also thank the Office of the Clerk, the Task Force, and all those who in their various ways contributed immensely towards making this day a success. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses and guides us all. Honorable members, before putting the question, may I kindly ask all guests to remain seated to allow His Excellency, the President, to take leave of the chambers to be followed by the Vice President, Cabinet Ministers, and others. On that note, Honorable members, I will now put the question. Be resolved that this August Assembly do stand adjourned until Monday, 1st July, 2024. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. This assembly now stands adjourned until Monday, 1st July, 2024, at 10 a.m. prompt. <laughs>